Good morning, my name is uh, Reverend David Clark and welcome to Malvern Baptist Church. Traditionally the church's calendar this Sunday is known as Low Sunday um, because uh, in the past people have had a tendency to stay away from church and they're all exhausted after the festivities of Easter. But uh, this is not going to be low for us. Despite lockdown we serve a risen saviour and we believe that uh, he's alive and that we can worship him and rejoice in his resurrection. Our first reading is from Revelation chapter 5. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands and ten thousand times ten thousand. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. In a loud voice they were saying, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honour and glory and praise. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them saying, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honour and glory and power for ever and ever. The four living creatures said, Amen, and the elders fell down and worshipped. Let us echo that feeling of praise by singing together, Come People of the Risen King. Psalm 89. 
I will sing of the Lord's great love forever. With my mouth I will make your faithfulness known through all generations. I will declare that your love stands firm forever, that you have established your faithfulness in heaven itself. You said I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to David my servant. I will establish your line forever and make your throne firm through all generations. The heavens praise your wonders, O Lord, your faithfulness too in the assembly of the holy ones. For who in the skies above can compete with the Lord? Who is like the Lord among the heavenly beings? In the council of the holy ones, God is greatly feared. He is more awesome than all who surround him. Who is like you, Lord Almighty? You, Lord Almighty, and your faithfulness surrounds you. You rule over the surging sea. When its waves mount up, you still them. You crush Rahab like one of the slain. With your strong arm, you scattered your enemies. The heavens are yours and yours also the earth. You founded the world and all that is in it. You created the north and the south. Tabor and Hermon sing for joy at your name. Your arm is endowed with power. Your hand is strong, your right hand exalted. Righteousness and justice are the foundations of your throne. Love and faithfulness go before you. Blessed are those who have learned to acclaim you, to walk in the light of your presence, Lord. They rejoice in your name all day long. They celebrate your righteousness, for you are their glory and strength. And by your favour you exalt our horn. Indeed, our shield belongs to the Lord, our King, to the Holy One of Israel. Let us sing again, see what I'm wanting. say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. 
Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Let's sing again. The head that once was crowned with thorns is crowned with glory now. Testament reading is taken from the book of Hebrews chapter 1 and continuing on to chapter 2. And this is the first of our sermon series entitled We Have an Anchor. Uh, taken from the book of Hebrews. In the past God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom he made the universe. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. So he became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. But to which did the angels, did God ever say, You are my son, today I have become your father. Or again, I will be his father and he will be my son. And again, when God brings his firstborn into the world, he says, Let all God's angels worship him. And speaking of the angels, he says, He makes his angels winds, his servants flames of fire. But about the son, he says, Your throne, O God, will last forever and ever, and righteousness will be the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hate wickedness. Therefore God, your God, has set you above your companions by anointing you with the oil of joy. He also says, In the beginning, O Lord, you laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment. You will roll them up like a robe. Like a garment, they will be changed, but you remain the same, and your years will never end. To which of the angels did God ever say, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Are not all angels ministering spirits to serve those who will inherit salvation? We must pay more careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard, so that we do not drift away. 
For if the message spoken by angels was binding, and every violation and disobedience received its just punishment, how shall we escape if we ignore such a great salvation? This salvation which was first announced by the Lord was confirmed to us by those who heard him. God also testified to it by signs, wonders and various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. Lord, I pray that as we listen to your word this morning, we will pay more careful attention. And as we listen, we would realise this is the very word of God speaking into our lives. I pray, Lord, that you fill with your, with your spirit now as I speak. Angels are normally more associated with Christmas when they seem to get everywhere in the nativity plays, on top of the Christmas tree, on stamps, on gift tags. But angels are quite prominent in the Easter story too. In Luke 22, an angel appears alongside Jesus as he prays in Gethsemane to strengthen him. In Matthew's Gospel, an angel rolls the stone away from the empty tomb and announces the resurrection of Jesus to the women. And in John's account, Mary sees two angels inside the open tomb where Jesus' body once lay. The writer to the Hebrews speaks a lot about angels in chapters 1 and 2, but he does so in comparison to his main subject, to show us who this Jesus Christ that he writes about really is. And this Jesus is God's prophetic voice. In the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. Jesus is God's son and heir. The son whom he appointed heir of all things. Jesus is God's creative agent through whom he made the universe. Jesus is God's glory personified. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. This is a tremendous statement of Jesus' deity. Jesus is God's cosmic sustainer, sustaining all things by his powerful words. It's not money which makes the world go round, it's Jesus. Hallelujah. And Jesus is God's unique sacrifice after he had provided purification for sins this Jesus went into heaven Jesus is God incarnate master of the universe and he died for you and for me and lastly Jesus is God's co-ruler he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven and that's where Jesus is now ruling in heaven alongside the Father. And moreover, the writer says that Jesus is superior to the angels. So he became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. And why is this an issue? Well, we don't know who wrote the book of Hebrews. There are many theories. But we know that they were well educated and they were writing to largely Jewish Christians in the Mediterranean world. And to most Jews, angels were exalted beings, especially revered because they were involved in giving the law at Sinai to the Jews. And this was God's supreme revelation, according to them. The Dead Sea Scrolls reflect the expectation that the archangel Michael would be the supreme figure in the messianic kingdom. And there's a probability that the recipients of this letter to the Hebrews were being tempted to assign angels a place above Jesus Christ the Messiah. Maybe they were influenced by Jewish myths in which angels figured prominently. The myths and the endless genealogies that Paul refers to in Timothy and Titus, which later developed into Gnosticism. 
But the writer to the Hebrews proves the superiority of Jesus to angels by six Old Testament quotations. He says Jesus has a superior nature as God's son. He says, you are my son, today I've become your father. This passage from Psalm 2 is quoted in Acts 13, as fulfilled in Christ's resurrection. I will be his father and he will be my son. This royal personage, this Jesus, is neither an angel nor an archangel. He is God's son. Secondly, Jesus has a superior dignity as God's firstborn. It says in verse 6, let all God's angels worship him. This is possibly quoted from Psalm 97, which in the Old Testament refers to the Lord God, and it's here applied to Christ, giving a clear indication of his full deity. The very beings with whom Christ is being compared are commanded to proclaim his superiority by worshipping him. He says in verse 7, he makes his angels winds, his servants flames of fire. Quoting Psalm 104, the angels serve God. Thirdly, Jesus has a superior role to the angels as God's messianic ruler. Verse 8, but about the sun, he says, your throne, O God, will last forever. This is from Psalm 45, and the author selects a passage that points to the deity of the messianic king, further demonstrating the son's superiority over angels. And fourthly, Jesus does a superior work as God's creative agent. He quotes Psalm 102, In the beginning, O Lord, you laid the foundations of the earth. And lastly, he has a superior destiny as God's co-ruler. He sits at God's right hand. And this is a quote from Psalm 110, which is applied repeatedly to Jesus in the book of Hebrews. So the writer puts angels in their proper place. They are not only inferior to Jesus, but they are servants sent to serve the saints. That's believers, Christian believers, you and I. Are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? You and I inherit salvation. The angels are there to serve us. Angels have an important part in the working of God's kingdom, but they are fundamentally God's concern. We are not to speculate about them, fear them, worship them, pray to them, or call them up. Even Jesus didn't call upon angels in his prayers. He said this in Gethsemane. Put your sword back in its place, Jesus said to, to, to them, that's his disciples. For all who draw the sword will die by the sword. Do you not think I cannot call upon my Father? And he will at once put at my disposal more than twelve legions of angels. Many people get this wrong. I mean, angels are big business, especially in the United States of America. There are 91 million websites um, that you, uh, you get if you type in angel in a search engine. Some of this is sentimental tosh. Much is a cult. You know, people who call upon personal guardian angels. Um, and when they do that, Sometimes they're calling up demonic, familiar spirits. This is not something we should do as Christians. We call upon the Lord and he answers. If he wishes to dispatch his angels, that's his business. Well, you might say all this angel stuff is very interesting, but so what? Well, there's a therefore in chapter 2. Verse 1. Usually it's a very important link word in the New Testament letters. Usually it's a link between the doctrine, what we believe about God and Jesus, and ethics, what we do about that belief. It's a link between the theory and the practice, if you like. And so here it is also. 
because God has spoken powerfully through his son, the writer says we must pay more careful attention. What should we do? Yes, pay more careful attention. And he develops this argument. For if the message spoken by angels was binding, and every violation and disobedience received its just punishment, how should we escape if we ignore such a great salvation? i.e. this salvation which was first announced by the Lord. You see, the message that he talks about here is the, the law, the law given to Moses at Sinai. And angels were active in giving the law, and that's indicated by Deuteronomy 33. The Lord came from Sinai and dawned over them from Seir. He shone forth from Mount Paran. He came with myriads of his holy ones, that's angels, from the south and from his mountain slopes. And so disobedience to the law given through angels brought God's discipline upon Israel, who ignored it. How then can Christians, the new Israel, afford to ignore the superior message which has come through Jesus Christ, who is vastly superior to the angels? And this message of Jesus was further concerned, confirmed by the testimony of the apostles and other eyewitnesses and the witness of God's Holy Spirit at work in gifts and miracles. The danger of not listening, the writer says in chapter 2, verse 1, is that of drifting away. A week ago, uh, there was that ship, wasn't there, that was grounded in the Suez Canal, the Eber Stuck or something, and it drifted in the crosswinds into the bank because the pilot or the captain or somebody wasn't paying enough attention. And it's cost the world billions of dollars. If you go to Ramsgate Maritime Museum in Kent, you can see the Goodwin Sands light vessel. Um, this was once war moored off the coast of Kent, above the notorious shifting Goodwin Sands. The Goodwin Sands um, were a graveyard of many drifting ships in the Channel. Ships who had lost power or who failed to observe the charts, the lights, the buoys, or the weather forecast, or their compass. And they were founded upon these sands. You see, for the first century Jewish Christians, there was a danger of them drifting back onto the sands of traditional Judaism. It was easier for them, it was more comfortable for them. They could avoid the persecution of being a follower of Jesus. Or they could drift up the intriguing creek of Jewish mysticism. Now, safe to say that I, I guess most of us are unlikely to drift into Judaism. But there are many false teachings around us, on the edges and outside of Christianity. And there's a very real danger for us of drifting away. And all the more danger, I think, because of the lack of persecution and violence. I think we're more tempted to drift yeah, than to buckle under persecution. And drifting starts with failing to listen to Jesus intently in our lives. And when we do that, our prayer life erodes, our worship degrades. And this can happen with all the trappings of tradition around us. We can continue to go to church, we can serve on the rotors. And therefore, to many people, it looks invisible from the outside. But after a while, our commitment will drop and we may stop attending worship so frequently. And we're tempted then to start listening to the other voices around us, the culture that says, take it easy. You know, life is good. Life is pleasurable. Relax into your comfortable armchair. Satisfy yourself. And that's often associated with materialism. Life is all about stuff and status and power and success. Now, whoever wins is the one who ends up with the most toys. Or there's the voice of reason that says there's no such person as God. We've got science. Science solves all the problems. Or mystery. 
You know, there are other realities around us. We could be drawn into false religion, particularly the New Age, which is actually not very New Age at all. It's just a, a, a bunch of old time hocus pocus all wrapped up in a new package. Or family pressure. You know, when our families just don't like the new Christian you. Or tradition, that longing for the old days. And I just want to focus on this a little bit. As we move out of lockdown, I think there will be a somewhat understandable temptation for us to relax a bit and go back to normal. And I think we can apply that to church life too. Now, wouldn't it be great just to come back to church and do what we used to do before lockdown and COVID so rudely interrupted? But I think God wants to take us on, to take us deeper, to grow our Christ-likeness uh, and, and help us to be more effective in kingdom mission. We should not waste this opportunity. Let's just not drift back into the comfortable. But ask God, Lord, what have you been teaching us over the last year? Show us you know, the path in which we should go. And if we fail to listen to God, if we drift, then we can start to compromise with sin. We can say to ourselves, well, it's only a little one. Yeah, a little one, what you fancy does you good. And once we start to compromise with sin, then we're in danger of drifting upon the sands, of hitting the rocks. But because God is a gracious God, he will discipline us. But that discipline will not be pleasant. Drifting Christians are miserable Christians. We need to remember that we have a superior saviour with a superior message who calls us to live life at a superior level. I'm not talking about prosperity gospel here. I'm talking about living the authentic Christian life. In the words of the great American theologian Tina Turner, he's simply the best, better than all the rest. Why should we listen to other voices other than those voices, that voice of Jesus who calls us forwards? We should remember the witnesses, the apostolic message of Scripture, and the evidence of God at work in our lives and in those around us. Let's listen to Jesus. Let's press in to follow him. Jesus has won the victory over the world, the flesh and the devil. His message is more coherent than other messages that we are bombarded with daily. We can hear his voice if we only stop and listen. We serve a risen Saviour. Amen. Let's pray. Oh Jesus, I have promised to serve thee to the end. Be thou forever near me, my master and my friend. I shall not fear the battle if thou art by my side, nor wander from the pathway if thou wilt be my guide. Oh, let me feel thee near me. The world is ever near. I see the sights that dazzle, the tempting sounds I hear. My foes are ever near me, around me and within. But Jesus, draw thou nearer and shield my soul from sin. Oh, let me hear thee speaking in accents clear and still, above the storms of passion, the murmurs of self-will. Oh, speak to reassure me, to hasten or control. O oh, speak and make me listen, thou guardian of my soul. Let us uh, sing our final song, or oh, hail the power of Jesus' name.
thanks and praise. Because of your great mercy, you give us new life through the resurrection of your Son. Fill us with your living hope that in all times of joy and despair we may trust you, the one true God who makes all things new. Amen. 